All right, so let's start up on this uh, final part of today's uh, class. So big, uh, important class today. This was where we kind of did that uh, turning point uh, and started looking at hypothesis testing, started looking at inferential statistics, started looking at the skills that we're developing, where we can actually do the kind of cool stuff where we can tell if a treatment works. We can see if an intervention is effective and you are now learning the real world statistical skills uh, that you can use maybe even in your own advanced lab coming up uh, or in any other place where you have to look at data and make a conclusion about uh, a particular population. So we're going to continue on with our look at uh, chapter 5. We're going to go over uh, the core of logic testing. Uh, once again, you'll get a quick recap. And then we're going to take a look at it from another perspective. So again, uh, hopefully during the course of this uh, uh, semester, uh, the core logic of hypothesis testing will eventually make sense to you. However, uh, again, you do not need to completely understand this in order to uh, do uh, hypothesis testing. And we're going to take a look at uh, one more demo of hypothesis testing. Uh, where we take a look at uh, a more realistic situation, uh, the type of testing that uh, would have been done in Harlow and Zimmerman's uh, 1959 study on affectional responses in infant monkeys, the beginning of uh, attachment theory in developmental psychology. All right, so once again, hypothesis testing, systematic procedure, where we're taking a look at the results of a study, where we're taking a look at the scores of a sample and determining if it predicts or uh, supports an idea or a hypothesis that we have about a population. And typically the hypothesis is this treatment will work for the population. And importantly notice that we are dealing with a sample, that's what we have access to, but that's not where we want to end up. We want to end with saying something about that population. So in hypothesis testing, we typically only have access to a sample, sometimes only a single individual, and we want to be able to say something about a population of individuals based on our analysis of that sample. So as we just saw, the hypothesis that we're testing, the idea that we're testing, is that if we started with a population, and for this intro, again, we're dealing with a known population. We know the mean, we know the standard deviation. If we took our treatment and applied it to the entire population, would our treatment change that population into a new population, a treated population? If so, then our treatment is effective. However, we can't do this as psychologists, either ethically or just uh, feasibly. There's no way that we can test an entire population. So what we do is we take a sample from that known population and we treat the sample instead. So we treat the sample and then we end up with a treated sample. We end up with a sample and we have to determine has this treated sample changed enough so that it now belongs to the treated population, in which case our treatment has done something, it has an effect, or has this sample not changed at all, in which case it still belongs to the old known population. So again, we're starting this intro by assuming that we forgot to measure that sample before we treated it, uh, so that all that we have is our treated sample, and all that we have is our known population. Those are the only two pieces of information that we have in order to make this determination of whether our treatment does anything. So let's take a look at these two in a little bit closer detail. We'll move them together. So there is our known population, and there's our sample from our treated population. And let's say that that's where their scores lined them up, right? So we have our sample mean, sorry, our population mean right there. We have our sample mean right there. And notice that we have a difference between the sample mean and our population mean. We have some difference between the two of those. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is why do we have that difference? What caused that difference? That is the core logic of hypothesis testing. So if it is, if that difference is too small, 
if it's likely that this sample still belongs to that known population because that difference is not big enough, well then we say that our sample still belongs to our population and our treatment does nothing. So if you, if that's a population of depressed individuals and I take a sample out of that population of depressed individuals and I treat them and they still belong to the population of depressed individuals, my treatment did nothing. I've taken depressed people and I've changed them into depressed people. My treatment does nothing. That's the case that we have here. If your sample from your, that you treated still belongs to your uh, known population. In that case, the treatment does nothing, we accept the null hypothesis. On the other hand, if that difference is large enough so that our sample no longer belongs to the known population, then we say that our sample doesn't belong to the known population, which means that it belongs to a new population, a treated population, and if that's the case, then our treatment did something. Right? If I take depressed individuals and I give them a treatment and they now belong to a population that's different, non-depressed individuals, well then my treatment did something and that's when you accept the research hypothesis and reject the null hypothesis. So the question remains, how do we know if this difference here is big enough in order to uh, say that our sample still belongs to this known population, our treatment does nothing, or does our treated sample belong to a treated population, our treatment did something. How can we figure out how big that difference needs to be? Well, the way that we can figure it out is we go back to this idea of samples and populations. So if you recall, we have samples that are being used to estimate population parameters, and we have that challenge where for any particular population, we don't know when we take our sample, where our sample came from. Maybe our sample came from the center of the population, in which case our sample is very close to the mean of the population. Maybe on the other hand, our sample came from the extreme ends of the population, in which case if we find a difference between our sample mean and our population mean, it's not due to a treatment. It's due to the fact that we have extreme members of that population in our sample. Maybe it came from the other side of that population. So once again, in this situation here, we have uh, the case where our sample mean is different than our population mean. However, it's not different because of a treatment. It's different because we just ended up with extreme people from this particular population. So that's the question we got to ask ourselves. When we see this difference, is this difference because our treatment did something? Is that why we're seeing this difference? Or is this difference because we picked extreme individuals unknowingly from this particular population? So what is that difference? Is it a treatment or is it this unlikely difference here, this unlikely reason here that we picked extreme people from this particular population. And that's what the hypothesis test is telling you. That's what it's letting you decide between. So we used phrases like probability, like likelihood, and what we're saying is we want to know what is the probability that a sample that has a mean this high could have come from the known population. What is the probability of choosing extreme individuals like this randomly from your population. What is that chance? What is that probability? If it is highly, whoops, if it's highly likely, that means that your treatment does nothing. So if we take individuals and we end up with a difference like this, and that difference is just highly likely, right? That difference would be like getting random people on your IQ Olympics team and your average IQ on that team is 110. That's not unheard of. That's kind of likely that it would happen. If your sample mean is likely to have happened without the treatment being effective, then we, then we conclude that our treatment does nothing. 
So if your sample mean is likely to occur on its own because of random, uh, a, a, a random chance, we say that the treatment does nothing. And we accept the null hypothesis. If, on the other hand, we figure out the probability that the sample came from the known population, and that probability is highly unlikely, very unlikely to occur, right? In the IQ Olympics example, if you get an IQ team and their IQ is 140, that is very unlikely to happen. You need to have geniuses at every single position on your team. That sample is highly unlikely. Possible, right? It's possible you could have gotten lucky. Somebody's got to win the lottery, but it's highly unlikely. If your sample mean is highly unlikely to occur by chance, we say that the only thing left is that your treatment did something, right? Because it's either chance or your treatment. If you say it's too extreme to occur by chance, then it has to be your treatment that is doing the work. So in that case, we reject the null hypothesis and we say, yeah, it's a highly unlikely sample. That means that our treatment probably did something. And then the last thing we need to do in this is we need to define how likely is likely. So I was using phrases like, well, you know, it's highly likely, it's highly unlikely, this would never happen, this would happen. Uh, we need to nail that down so that we have an actual number that we can all agree on and we can say this is how likely that likely is. This is the, where our line in the sand is going to be. So where is that line in the sand? That line in the sand is given to you typically and it is called the alpha level. The alpha level is where you draw your line in the sand. The alpha level is how unlikely a sample has to be before you no longer believe it's part of that original population. And that alpha level is what you compare your actual sample to. So if, uh, your, main, if your sample mean, if your sample, if the probability of getting your sample is higher then that alpha level, then we accept the null hypothesis. If, on the other hand, the probability of getting your sample is lower than that alpha level, your, your sample is less likely to occur than whatever percentage that alpha level is, then you reject your null hypothesis. So that idea of an alpha level is your line in the sand, and that is where you compare your sample's probability to. So greater than alpha, we say that this, this um, sample is likely to have occurred. So typically an alpha level, you'll see this all the time, typically an alpha level is 0.05. That's basically 5%. So if your sample, if getting a sample this extreme will occur more then 5% of the time, your sample's probability is greater than alpha, then we say that the treatment does nothing. That sample was likely enough to have occurred just on its own. On the other hand, and we accept the null hypothesis, on the other hand, if your probability of your sample is less than alpha, if we take a look at our sample and we say, a sample this extreme only has a 1% chance of occurring randomly, that's less than 5%, uh, then we reject the null hypothesis and we say that our treatment actually does something. So that's the core idea, again, just in another way behind hypothesis testing. And uh, if you're interested in uh, figuring out why most uh, psychology uh, studies choose 5%, there's a lot of studies done on uh, alpha levels and uh, who gets to choose them and why they do that. And we'll talk more about different alpha levels uh, in another class. But interestingly, 5% seems to be a psychological limit uh, beyond which we stop believing in chance occurrences. So I'll give you an example that'll kind of explain this 5%. Let's say that you were in a game and you had no reason to believe that this game was rigged. You had no reason to believe that this game was unfair. <coughs> you had no information about this game one way or another. And the game was that, was that you're going to flip a coin, and if the coin comes up heads, you're going to win a dollar. And if the coin comes up tails, you're going to lose a dollar. So that's the game. You win a dollar on heads, you lose a dollar on tails. 
If that coin flips and it comes up tails, would you be willing to say that that coin is unfair? So after that one flip, would you say, wait a second, this game is rigged, this is unfair, after coming up tails once? So anyone? No. Of course not. Let's say that you flip it again, and it comes up tails again. Would you then stand up and say, unbelievable, this is rigged, there's no way two tails could come up in a row? No, you would be like, all right, I got unlucky, two tails in a row? I've heard of that before. Third flip, you get another tail. All of a sudden you start get a little, getting a little uh, suspicious, but still, it's not enough. Not enough to say, uh, you know, not enough to call the game out. So let's say that the tails keep coming up and keep coming up and keep coming up. How many tails do you need before most people would say, wait a second, let me see that coin. This game is rigged, I don't believe it. Even though this many tails in a row is possible, it's beyond my ability to believe it as a human being. It turns out that the probability where that occurs is right around 5%. Right around 5% is where we stop believing in chance and we start saying something must be going on here. That's why we got that alpha level right there. All right, so let's apply this now. Hypothesis testing, one more look. And uh, once again, we got our five-step procedure. This five-step procedure will remain constant uh, as we go through. And uh, at this point, uh, we are going to um, kind of concentrate in on uh, step three and uh, step four here. So uh, in this new uh, hypothesis test that we're going in this new uh, procedure, I will have a few things to say about step three and uh, step four. All right, so let's set this up. And for this, we're actually going to an actual psychology experiment uh, that was done in the 50s. So this is uh, Harlow, uh, the famous Harlow uh, Monkeys uh, Infant Attachment Studies. And uh, these were the studies that basically showed that infants need more than just uh, food, water, clothing, and shelter. So this is what changed parenting to providing resource, uh, resources to actually providing love. So if you take a look at, for example, the changing role of fathers, in, uh, in American uh, households, fathers used to be nothing more than a bread earner. You were an awesome dad if you put a roof over everybody's head, you put food on their table, and you put clothes on their backs, and you were done, A plus dad. This was the study that showed that no, you actually need to interact with your children as well. They need comfort and attention. So let's take a look at uh, actual video from, uh, I believe it was this study, if not one that was very much like it. No, it was this one. Let's pull it up. Newborn rhesus monkeys will grow up not in accordance with nature, but in a controlled atmosphere of a laboratory, where all the psychological influences of childhood can be duplicated. In a classic continuum study, infant monkeys are removed from the mother at birth and raised in semi-isolation. Other individuals can be seen and heard, but there is no physical contact, no interaction. Mother is a bit of plastic and shaggy cloth, a doll with no life of its own, but capable of nourishing the life of an infant. Placed deliberately on a clock mother which has no milk to nourish him, but for 
fulfill some fundamental needs. This experiment revolves around one simple question. Will the infant monkey switch his affection to a wild mother which offers food and life itself? All right, so that was a classic, uh, that was footage from the classic um, infant study. Um, this is the original uh, paper here. I highly recommend, if you are interested in uh, any aspect, particular aspects of psychology, always go and find the original research. Uh, uh, Harlow and Zimmerman's uh, monkey uh, studies, infant attachment studies, have been reported in so many textbooks. Um, but if this is your area that you're interested in, do yourself a favor, go find the original reports to see what they actually read. This PDF is available on Canvas if you are so interested. All right, so Harlow uh, uh, would have tested these monkeys and would have measured how long the monkey spent with the terry cloth mother. And then he would have wanted to analyze that data to see did the terry cloth mo monkeys, sorry, did the actual baby monkeys prefer the terry cloth mother or did he just end up with a weird sample of terry cloth mother loving monkeys in his experiment? So that's what you would want to know. Is it a real effect? Is the love for terry cloth mothers real? Or did they just end up with a weird sample of monkeys? So we'll set up the situation here. So uh, we'll make a couple of assumptions just to simplify things, but we are getting more and more uh, real as we go along. So in a classic study of infant attachment, Harlow 1959 placed infant monkeys in cages with two artificial surrogate mothers. One mother was made from bare wire mesh and contained a baby bottle from which the infant could feed. The other mother was made from soft terry cloth and did not provide access to food. Harlow observed the infant monkeys and recorded how much time they spent per day with each mother. In a typical day, the infant spent a total of 18 hours clinging to one of the two mothers. Uh, if there was no preference between the two, we would expect the time to be divided evenly with an average of nine hours for each of the mothers and a standard deviation of 5.29. So that's something that uh, we have to assume for this uh, particular experiment. But in the population of monkeys, uh, if there was no preference between terry cloth or wire mesh, they would spend nine hours with each monkey, right? You got 18 hours to, uh, in the day to spend with the two mothers. If you didn't care which one you were on, if you had no preference, you would on average nine hours with the mother, terry cloth mother, nine hours with the wire mesh mother. So that would be the population of monkeys that did not prefer uh, one mother over the other. What he actually found was that the typical monkey in his experiment spent about 15 hours per day with the terry cloth mother indicating that there was a strong preference for that soft, cuddly mother. So let's suppose that we have a sample of nine infant monkeys, and they averaged 15.3 hours per day with a terry cloth mother. Is this result sufficient to conclude that the monkeys uh, significantly spent more time with the terry cloth mother than would be expected if there was no preference? Is this enough to say that the population of monkeys actually uh, prefers the terry cloth mother, or did we end up with a weird sample of nine terry cloth mother loving monkeys? So just to kind of drive that home, I'm running out of boardroom here. Let's say that we had a population, the real population of monkeys, likes to spend on average nine hours with a terry cloth mother, right? No preference for terry cloth or wire mesh then they would spend nine hours with the terry cloth mother. These monkeys over here 
would be the monkeys that like to spend time with the terry, oh, sorry, with the wire mesh mother. So they don't spend a lot of time with the terry cloth mother, they're spending time with the wire mesh mother. These monkeys over here, they just happen to be part of the same population, but they're the monkeys that like to spend time with the terry cloth mother. So you have a population of monkeys with no preference. But again, monkeys are just like people. They're diverse. They have differences. So what we're asking is, does our sample indicate that this entire population is wrong? We have a new population, one that prefers the terry cloth mothers, or did we just get unlucky and our sample came from one of the extreme ends of our distribution? So which one is it? That's what we're going to find out. We're going to do a two-tailed test with an alpha, there it is, a 0.05, that level of 5%. All right, so let's go through the five steps. Step one, restate the question as a research hypothesis and a null hypothesis about the population. We want to know, is there a preference for the terry cloth mother or for the wire mesh mother? We want to know, is there a preference for one of these two mothers? And this is the question that was asked by Harlow because when he did this study, he had no idea was the, whether the monkey's going to choose uh, the soft, cuddly mother for physical comfort, or were they going to choose the wire mesh mother with food for actual, you know, sustenance. So which one would they prefer? That's what we wanted to know. The research hypothesis says that there is a preference for one of the mothers. Monkeys will prefer maybe the terry cloth, maybe food. We don't know which way, but there will be a preference. And that's written as saying that the mean time that a population will spend with the terry cloth mother will not equal the mean time that they spend with the wire mesh mother. So we have 18 hours that we allow these monkeys to spend with the mothers. And if the research hypothesis is correct, then the mean time spent with the terry cloth mother will not equal the mean time spent with the wire mesh mother. That will not equal nine hours. Because again, if they have 18 hours to spend with the two mothers and they prefer one of them, they'll spend more than half their time, more than nine hours, with one of those mothers. That's the research hypothesis, that there is a preference for one of these types of mothers. The null hypothesis is that there is no preference. No preference for either mother. So on average, that's this population right here where we say this is the population where there's no preference for either mother. So on average, monkeys will spend nine hours with the terry cloth mother, and on average, they'll spend the same amount of time with the wire mesh mother. They'll spend nine hours in general with each mother. So those are our two uh, hypotheses, research hypotheses, that the, two, uh, the mean time spent with the two mothers will be different. Null hypothesis, the mean time spent with the two mothers will be the same for the populations of monkeys. All right, step two, determining the characteristics of the comparison distribution. Determining the characteristics of this distribution of sample means. We're still gonna see how to do that in chapter six. It's still coming up. For now, it's gonna be given to you. And these are the characteristics of the distribution. Notice it's the exact same situation. All I gotta do to update this is get rid of the specific numbers and put in the new numbers. So we have a distribution of sample means, a comparison distribution that has a mean of nine hours, indicating no preference for either mother, and we got a standard deviation of 1.76. And like I said, you'll, get, you'll figure out how to get those numbers very soon. But for right now, I'll be giving them to you until we get to chapter 6. All right. So that's the comparison distribution, right? This is the comparison distribution. The distribution of sample means. This is the population distribution. Distribution of individuals. We cannot compare our sample to a distribution of individuals. That's unfair. We compare our sample of nine monkeys to this distribution of sample means. Now, we can't actually compare it to this the way that it is because this is in no appendix in any uh, statistics textbook. So we gotta transform this into our unit normal distribution has a mean of zero, standard deviation of one. 
All right, so now that we've transformed this into our unit normal distribution, we're ready to set a cutoff sample score and a critical value. And this, again, is the target against which you're going to compare the rest of your, uh, the results of your study. We're going to see how to do this very soon. Right now, I'm still going to give it to you. And notice that it's the same as it was before. So a bit of a spoiler alert, these cutoff scores are directly tied to your alpha levels. Right? So if your alpha level doesn't change, your cutoff scores will not change. Right? So the cutoff scores and the alpha levels, they're tied together. That's why, whoops, there it is. That's why uh, it hasn't changed since our initial example because our alpha level hasn't changed. All right, so that's step three. We set our critical scores. We set our lines in the sand. This side of the distribution, these are where the monkeys who prefer the terry cloth mother might end up. This side of the distribution, these are the monkeys that prefer the wire mesh mother. So we're looking, any difference? Is there any preference for either one? Step number four, we need to determine our sample's score, our sample mean, on this comparison distribution. Where is it here? So in order to do that, we need to change just the way we change the entire distribution into z-scores, we need to change our sample mean into z-scores. So from the experiment, Harlow found that his monkeys spent 15.3 hours with the terry cloth mother. So 15.3 hours, there's nine hours on the comparison distribution. 15.3 is gonna be somewhere on this side. But we need to find out exactly where it is. Don't have a table for this have a table for this to transform scores. So we need to take our sample mean, we need to take the mean of the comparison distribution, the standard deviation of the comparison distribution, use that to calculate our z-score, and we end up with a z-score of 3.57. So what that means is that if this, on our z-score comparison distribution, that's a mean of zero, that's 1.96, two, two and a half, three, three and a half. Our sample mean of monkeys went all the way out to like three and a half. Our sample mean of monkeys has a z-score that's all the way out there at three and a half, 3.57. So they crossed the line and they kept going. So what this means is either our treatment does something, terry cloth mothers are preferred, or we ended up with one of the most unlikely uh, sample of terry cloth mother loving monkeys ever put together. We ended up with everybody that's extreme. That's so unlikely, it crossed the tails. Our treatment pushed our sample into those tails so now we're ready to make our final decision. So if the sample z-score, the z-score we just calculated, is beyond the cutoff scores, yes it is, it went into the tails, if that's the situation, we accept the research hypothesis and we reject the null hypothesis. That's the situation right here. That's what we're in, that's what we're gonna do. If on the other hand, the sample z-score is within the cutoff z-score, if our sample stayed in the body here somewhere, then we would accept the null hypothesis and we would reject the research hypothesis. So as it is, our sample z-score 3.57 pushed it into the tails, so we reject the null hypothesis and went beyond the cutoff scores and we conclude that uh, monkeys actually do prefer the terry clock mother. So this is what Harlow would have concluded that's the type of test Harlow would have actually have done uh, on his uh, data in order to come to this uh, conclusion. So we're going to wrap up in just a moment here, but uh, before we get to that, I just want to make a very, very, very important, um, a very important announcement about this step right here. So step number five is one of the most straightforward steps in hypothesis testing. It's very straightforward to say, well, my sample went beyond the cutoff scores. What do I do? 
Now my sample stayed within the cutoff scores. What do I do? However, this is where many students get tripped up. And the reason for this is because it has, I believe the reason for this is because it's filled with double and triple negatives and it's hard to do the mental gymnastics. So I've done countless hypothesis tests. I've made this decision so many times. I don't need to look at these slides. I highly recommend for this course, have these slides ready. Have them next to you when you're doing hypothesis testing so that you don't make an error on this final step. So I have seen students do step one perfectly, do step two perfectly, step three, they figure out their comparison distribution perfectly. Step four, they calculate their z-scores perfectly. Step five, they go the wrong way, right? They've done everything correct and yet they go the wrong way on step five. So you can see, reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that your treatment has no effect. Rejecting it is saying that I, I say no to the treatment having no effect. It gets a little bit complicated until you really get you know, familiar with it. So I would highly recommend on your homework, on the exam, on any hypothesis test that you're doing, print out these two slides and just have them next to you. And when you draw your distribution, when you're going through your hypothesis test and you end up with your sample out here, give yourself a double check. You know, you can say, all right, I think I'm supposed to reject a null hypothesis. Let me double check. If the sample z-score is beyond the cutoff z-score, accept research, reject null. Excellent. That's what I'll do. If it's the other situation, check out this decision tree here. If the sample is within the cutoff z-scores, then you uh, accept the research hypothesis, uh, sorry, you accept the null hypothesis, I did it myself. Reject the research hypothesis. Don't get this hypothesis test 100% wrong because you got it, you made a mistake on that final, final step. So in the exam, in your homework, you'll get partial credit for each step along the way. In the real world, making that type of a mistake would be disastrous because you would either make the mistake of saying, you know what, this highly, highly effective treatment, in reality, I'm gonna conclude that it's ineffective. So I'm gonna rob millions of people from this highly effective treatment. That's one outcome, that's the better outcome. Because the other mistake is to say, oh, this highly ineffective treatment, I'm going to incorrectly conclude that it's effective. And I'm gonna start prescribing this treatment to, to millions of people affecting their lives in horrible, horrible ways. We have got to get, whoops, we have got to get step five right. There's no point in doing steps one to four correctly and then getting step five wrong. So until you are just like quick with it and exact with it and can't get it wrong, keep those two slides next to yourselves. And I'll just tell you in advance, I have graded so many exams where step one, perfect, step two, perfect, step three, awesome, step four, exact, step five, wrong way. And that could have been avoided with those two slides. All right, so make sure that you're doing those. Have them next to you when you're doing your homework. Have them next to you when you're doing your exam. Uh, and other than that, uh, that is all that I wanted to cover uh, for today. So in terms of the homework, uh, you got chapter four homework to do uh, before we meet next time. In terms of chapter five, we're not quite done yet. All right, so hypothesis testing is a very kind of involved process. There's a lot of moving parts and we haven't quite gotten to all the moving parts yet. So we had the question before about, well, what if you only want an increase, you know, and not, a, you know, not on both sides. We're gonna get to that. So that's why there's no homework quite yet for, for chapter five. You can definitely start working on it if you feel confident, but there's nothing that's gonna be due uh, for next time. So I would highly recommend, because this is what we're going to be doing for the rest of the semester, look over this concept a few times in the next, uh, you know, in the next few days. Uh, give it a rest, you know, leave it for today, come back and check, it, check your lecture notes again tomorrow, watch maybe one of the videos uh, tomorrow. Take a look at it a few times, because it's, it's one of those things that once it sinks in, it makes absolute sense and you will be doing hypothesis tests like it's, like it's your second job, right? You'll be doing it like you've been doing it your whole life. Until it gets there though, it's gonna be a bit of a struggle. You do have the five steps, those will always be there, but 
just kind of give it a little bit of time to sink in, revisit it, come back, get that distributed practice going. And uh, because I want to make sure that we got all the parts before we start doing the homework, there's no chapter five homework due for next class. There is chapter four homework due, so don't forget about the chapter four, but nothing for chapter five, so just let that all sink in. Uh, just a reminder, get your uh, Mindset Lab uh, uh, study plan points if you're not getting 100% on your uh, pretest. And also maybe just as practice, you know, do your study lab, uh, study plan, get really familiar and quick with those uh, decisions. And uh, the last thing I'll mention before we uh, just uh, wrap it up, turn it over to uh, practice time. Um, I've graded the exams. We were waiting on one final uh, makeup exam to be, uh, to be completed. So next class, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start uh, next class with a run through of the exam. So I'm gonna be basically doing a speed run of the exam. I will return your Excel sheet, so I'll upload those to Canvas so you can follow along. Um, and uh, we'll be taking that up uh, next class. And also I have, because Canvas cannot handle my grading scheme, I have put your projected, pro, uh, your projected grades, final grades, uh, uploaded for you, just kind of know how your progress is going. In order to do those projected grades, I have to assume that your performance right now is gonna remain steady throughout the course. So if you did poorly on exam number one, in order to do that projected final grade, I have to assume you're gonna do poorly on all the exams. If you did poorly on your homework so far, I gotta assume you're gonna be doing poorly on all your homework, and vice versa. If you did awesomely, you'll, you know, you'll continue to do amazingly. Because of that, if you're struggling right now, your projected final grade will be low, and you can turn it around massively because of the nature of this course and the nature of the grading scheme. So if you looked at your projected grade and thought, oh my gosh, that is so low, just know there's a lot of points left, there's a lot of exams left, a lot of homework left for you to turn this around. But in order to calculate those, to give students an idea of where they are in the course right now, I have to assume that your performance will stay steady. Uh, and that is not the greatest assumption because uh, most students uh, we'll struggle at the beginning a little bit, but then we'll turn it around and do amazing for the rest of the course. All right, so that is officially it. So right now we've got uh, practice time. If you're all statsed out, feel free to call it uh, an early day. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to start up on anything or if you have any questions about what we saw today, we still got about 10 minutes left, uh, so feel free to call me over. And that is all that I wanted to cover today.